In 1990, one of my younger brothers died in an avalanche while extreme skiing. He was only 21 years old. And my image of that time was of his body at the bottom of a 750-foot cliff, his bones all broken. When he was little, he used to break his bones a lot because he was a big risk taker. And I remember that the doctors used to always comment about how strong he was and how quickly he would heal. And I knew this time that it didn't matter how strong he was, that his bones would not be healing. And it seemed like my identity broke right alongside of his body on those rocks that day. And so the first thing I did was I looked to my parents and my father, who comes from a very long line of stoic Norwegians, had a very memorable quote, and it was, three out of three people die, so shut up and deal. My mother, on the other hand, my mother has been crying for 23 years. And so I knew I was going to have to forge my own path through this because I had really lost my parents in any functional sense because they were in their own pain and they were trying to negotiate their way through. And my son, who was only three or four at the time, came to me at one point and he said, well, what happens to you when you die? Where did Chad go? And of course, being an academic at the time, I said, well, Christians believe he's in heaven with God. And Buddhists believe he's going to come back as something else. And he said, you mean like a bug? I said, probably not a bug. He said, and then I said, you know, and there are scientists who believe that we're all just energy. And we kind of just rejoin the natural cycle. And he looked up at me with those big blue eyes and he said, yes, yes, mommy, but what do we believe? And it was a good question. And I had many questions about what was happening to me, what was happening to my family. And what I first did is I looked to my own discipline, which is psychology. And most grief theorists will say that we as humans, we invest our love or our energy into a person. And when that person dies, we're then disorganized. And we have to withdraw that energy and then we have to reinvest it in other people or projects, which is well-intentioned, I'm sure, and may even help some people. But for me, it missed the point completely. Because when we lose a loved one, we still love. And I wasn't ready by any means to stop loving. I came across this Japanese proverb, and it says, my barn having burned to the ground, I can now see the moon. And I just loved this because it introduced me to this idea that when we have to, when we're forced to say goodbye to someone in the physical, we're also being offered an opportunity to say hello to them in the imaginal. And it feels true, doesn't it? Because when we lose someone in the physical, it's almost like they're psychologically more present, aren't they? We think about them more. And beyond this, I also learned that we can use this imaginal relationship with the deceased to provide us with the metaphors that we need to produce the rituals that will actually usher that, the image of the deceased from the abstract back to the concrete and give us a medium through which we can still love. An example of this comes to us from some folk tales that take place around the desert regions of the American Southwest. Pinkola Estes talks about La Loba, or sometimes La Huesera, the wolf woman, or the bone woman. Anybody know these stories? In these stories, she is always fat, and she is sometimes very hairy. She has long, greasy gray hair in mats, and she sometimes even has a snaggletooth. 
And her job is to protect that which is in danger of being lost in this world. And so her cave is filled with bones. She has little tiny mouse bones and rattlesnake bones and hawk bones and coyote bones. But the most coveted bones of all are those of her namesake, the wolf. And what she does is she climbs and sifts and combs through the mountains, through the valleys, through the arroyos, the dry riverbeds, searching for bones. And she gathers them one by one, and she takes them back to her cave. And once she has them all there, she sits and very patiently puts them one at a time and reconstructs the skeleton of that wolf. And when that white, shiny skeleton is as a wolf should be, she sits quietly by her fire, and she thinks of what song she will sing. And in this quiet moment of love, the great drum of her heart becomes very audible. And it sounds like this. Ba-bump, 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 ba-bump. And this ancient rhythm gives rise to a song Ba bump, flesh, 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 flesh. And she sings the leathery pads on the bottom of the wolf's feet. And she sings the long sinewy legs. And she sings the strong haunches. Flesh, 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 flesh. And she sings the wide barrel of a chest and the long shaggy tail and the pointy ears and the yellow gray eyes for clear sight. And on her last note, she breathes life into the wolf. And feeling that in its lungs, its eyes fly wide open. It leaps up on its haunches out of the cave and in to the wild and natural world. As people who grieve, aren't we all a little bit like La Loba? Don't we all need to get in touch with our instinctual, our primitive selves to figure out how to get through this? Aren't we all protecting that which is in danger of being lost in this world? Aren't we all gathering bones? We gather memories, stories, pictures. I remember with my brother, every word he wrote suddenly seemed important. We wanted to dance to his music. We wanted to smell his clothes. And the small pin that said, just visiting this planet, seemed a numinous premonition. And we have to do this. We have to gather the bones, and we have to reconstruct them, because we have to author our loved one's story, and at the same time, author our own in relation to them. Because these reconstructed images will become the integrities, the angels, if you will, that will carry us through. Now, what of the next part? What of the singing over the bones? As a clinical psychologist, I've taught death and dying and also facilitated grief workshops for almost 20 years. And I believe I have seen some people sing over bones. One woman in our town lost her 18-month-old son in a horrific car accident. And about two months later, when she was in the most jagged places of her grief, she reread the sheriff's report. And it said that an unsecured car seat may have contributed to the fatality. Well, this woman set up car seat checkpoints in our town, and people would line up for blocks. And she was this little tiny person. And she would get into each car seat, and she'd put her little knee in there, and she'd pry, and she'd pull, and she'd tug until that seat was secure. And she said that every time she pulled on a seatbelt, she was loving Luke. I worked with a six-year-old little girl whose mom had died of breast cancer. Her father was beside himself. And she also felt very responsible for her little brother, who was only four. And when I was talking with her, I said, tell me about your mother. And her eyes flew open wide, and she said, 
Mama loves tea. And she came up with this idea of doing a tea party on Sundays. She would set a place for her brother and herself and her mother. And after a couple of months, even their father joined in to the tea party with her. And she says to this day, it's a meaningful ritual. And when she wants to talk to her mother, she sets an empty teacup across from herself. There's also the story from Chicago of the woman who lost her husband after 45 years. And since he was the one who drove all the time, she decided she was now going to walk or take the bus. And there she was, kind of trudging through that interminable gray, Chicago cold, windy winter. And she noticed, it seemed like everywhere she went, there were single gloves laying on the ground. And there was something about those single gloves that spoke to her, because they were useless without their mate. And so she bent down, and she picked up the glove, and she started collecting them and bringing them home. And she put them in the drawer of her old dresser until even the drawer overflowed. And when she couldn't fit them anymore, she took out her husband's old ladder. She went out to the backyard, to the tree they had planted together on their wedding day. She put that old ladder up. She climbed up with each glove fastened to fishing line and hung them all on the bare branches in the trees. And she said that when the wind blows, it is like they are waving goodbye and waving hello. What a lovely way of characterizing transitions. And I was interested in this. What happens when you take something from the abstract and make it concrete? What if you took it even further, take it from the abstract to the concrete and release it back to the abstract? When my children were little, on the anniversary of my brother's death, I used to take them down to the river with a purple rose. A purple rose because my brother loved the Grateful Dead. And the children would take turns pulling out the petals. And with each petal they pulled out, I would tell them something about their uncle. And then they would throw it in the water, and we would watch those memories and those stories float away on those scintillating ripples. Or on a much larger scale, this is also taking place in the rituals enacted at the temples at Burning Man. Now most people are familiar with the man and the burn and the party on Saturday, but there's actually a far more somber event that happens on Sunday. And that is each year in the Black Rock Desert, uh, they erect a temporary temple, and all Burning Man participants are invited to come inside and leave mementos, letters, objects to the deceased to communicate with them. So walking in, you might see a wedding dress hanging from the rafters with a note pinned on it that says quite simply, I'm sorry you missed our wedding. Or I saw a blonde little girl's braided hair with the purple ribbon still in it. And in crayon above it, it said, we miss you, Amy. Hundreds of army boots lined up in a row, each with the name of a soldier who had died in Afghanistan. Other people just wrote notes. One woman who lost her husband in a parasailing accident wrote, I hope I can go on without you. I fear that I will. Or still another said, Baby D, I'm so sorry. We weren't ready for you yet. And then the most astounding thing happens. On the final day of the festival, thousands sit around in sacred silence and watch these mementos burn. So what of these singing over bones? How can you do this in your own life? And just as the story suggests, I would start with the great drum of your own heart and let that be your guide. And there are other things you could consider. One, ask yourself, what brought your loved one great joy? 
And the more specific you can be about this, the better. Nani loved putting up ham pies for Easter. Uncle sang Frank Sinatra in his underwear on the balcony, much to the embarrassment of the entire family. Cousin wore a shirt under his graduation gown that said, my parents just think I went to college. <laughs> Sister loved the feeling, a tingly feeling of catching snowflakes on her tongue. So think about your loved one. I want you to also think about the physicality of the person you lost. Were they small like a bird, or were they tall like a giraffe? Were they substantial like an ox? What music made them move? What did it feel like to hug them? And who was the first to let go? What smell do you associate with your loved one? Maybe it's fresh cut grass, or trident gum, or sesame oil or lavender, or lilac, or peaches, or clove cigarettes. When you were with your loved one, how did they make you feel? Was it like climbing into a comfortable easy chair and you felt better about yourself? Or maybe it was more of a roller coaster ride and they tested you. And in terms of values, what did he or she feel strongly about? Maybe it was a good work ethic or social justice, or freedom, or fairness, and try to incorporate those ideals into your own ritual. And when we do this, and we sit in the greatest place of love, and we sing over these bones, I believe that marvelous things happen. Because we sing up new life, not only for our loved one, but we sing up new life for ourselves. Because as we give them permission to move, we give ourselves permission to move, too. I cannot fix my brother's bo broken bones at the bottom of that cliff in the physical. But I can gather them, and I can sing over them in the imaginal. Merwin said, your absence has gone through me like thread through a needle. Everything I do is stitched with its color. May your song be colorful, and may you keep loving. Thank you. And stars, some time around.